to get it, then, then I think we have a better opportunity. So I guess the first thing I want to do, uh, as I said, was jump into this idea about what we think um, as a group and just throw it around for 20 minutes or so. Um, success actually looks like um, in terms of open government. Like what, uh, what, what can we actually measure? At what point will we know, you know what, I think this is always a continual, continuum and I think we always need to be looking up and looking towards, aiming towards something. But quite often I hear people say, oh, open government, there's nothing happening. And then I can say, well, here's 20 things that are happening. I can come up with another 100 if you like. Um, but there, there's not, um, so I, I think we, we need to have a slightly more mature conversation about what do we define as success? What ideas do you have? Oh, and by the way, oh, sorry, there's two other things. With the laptop thingies, just make sure you're careful because apparently the, the desks flip down and you'll break your laptop. She said that at the beginning, but you know, I figured if anyone hasn't broken it yet, then maybe. Um, and, um, and when you go to ask questions, we're going to be passing microphones around and such so that we can actually record that. So just wait till the microphone gets to you. But does anyone want to throw in an idea? Like what's, what's a, a baseline that we can work from? Up here? No, no, no. Submitting my, ta Sorry. Submitting my taxes without having to use IE. Shall I say it again? <laughs> Doing my tax return online yeah. without having to use that other browser. Oh, yeah. Tax return online. Oh, and there's so much annoying background to that particular story. But do you know how I did my tax return this year? Like last year I used wine. Like, and that was annoying, but at least it worked. It didn't actually work this year. I actually, after mucking around and thinking, you know what, I could spend hours making this work. I don't have time to spend hours making this work. I actually went into the tax office and used their computer. <laughs> I couldn't even be bothered setting it. Like, I didn't want to run a bloody Windows VMware at home. Um, but um, yeah, it was, just, it was just amazing. So yeah. So, so let's just dig into that though. If we want that to happen, what are the things we need to happen? So maybe in terms of government procurement, um, basically maybe there should be a, a requirement that um, gov procurement should require um, open APIs to, um, to business systems. Open standards. Uh, the problem with open standards is they say, oh, it's an open standard. Let's go through the whole OXML thing again. Um, the the <laughs> open API, um, and we need to define what that means, right? But if we say, OK, um, an open standard, they can say, oh, yeah, it's an open standard in that you can export it to a PDF and a PDF is an open standard, sure, but an open API is a whole different approach. So if you say for all stuff that you publish, actually, sorry, I'm going to rewind. The open data agenda has been hurt massively by the open standards approach. And I'll tell you why. Because everyone has the data in systems that doesn't by default store it in an open data format. And if you're saying the only, re the only way that you can publish is if you make it available in an open data format. So they, they go to the effort of publishing and then they get slapped around because it's not an open format, which is understandable from our perspective, but from their perspective it's now a disincentive to publish because their system doesn't publish in open standards anyway. So then they have to translate it and they, it takes a lot of work. If you just get it up and put it into a system that you automatically does the transcoding, or you can actually put in place automated publishing systems that transcodes it on the way out, then that can work. But that's the problem. People say, oh, it's easy to just publish, just publish. Then they just publish, then they get slapped. It's, it's, very, it's very challenging. Anyway, open APIs for business systems and open standards, but we need to talk about that more. Next. Invest. Sorry, oh, sorry, down here. You've got a microphone, to wait. <laughs> in fact, I was, I was going to say, so you look come. at your, your tax return online, mm. rather than seeing it as a tech thing, just with browsers or APIs or that type of thing, the tax return itself, the government already knows through the systems how much tax we pay. So really your tax return becomes, can I lie better than the tax department? If you don't want to make any claims, if you don't want to do anything, it should all be automated. The citizen should never even have to do anything because everyone in government who's relevant knows how much tax is paid already. Yeah, but then you have to completely simplify the tax process to remove all the loophole that they've built into the system. That's what the tax returns about. It's not about saying this is how much tax I've paid. It's about saying this is what I've done legally to avoid as much tax as I possibly can. <laughs> so isn't, isn't the open government angle the fact that the system's too complicated? Let's look at the system. OK. Is the system too complicated? <laughs> Darwin, you've got to talk to the microphone. <laughs> Um, is the system too complicated? I think I think we're talking about government. Yes, it's going to be too complicated. Um, sorry, but yes. You don't want to say? Oh, I want to hear what you said. I was just going to have a side comment. No, a side comment would be good. I just went into the microphone. The only reason we're waiting for microphones is because it's being recorded. Like I know people can project, but we need to record it. Recorded. 
Thanks. Um, I was just wondering with the last thing about um, government procurement, whether right. rather than pushing for open standards, we should be pushing for machine readable or machine translatable, yeah. where we will accept patent encumbered whatevers provided we can get it into something else, yeah. uh, whether that's less scary for the people who don't want to be slapped. Mm. That's a, it's a really interesting thought. The microphone's right there. Oh, the person's right in front of you, so hand him the microphone. Yeah. So, efficiency. Maybe I'm slow, but just so I understand. We're not trying to, at this point, redefine what government is, but just talk about open. So whether taxation is fair or not or not, or if you want the queen or not, is not the discussion here, but more how to do it openly, right? That's yeah. the subject of today. So. I'll, I'll be doing my talk about open government on Thursday. Good. <laughs> we need action. We've got one down here. <laughs> I'm going to get dumped for trees on Monday, I swear to God. Um, question down here? Oh, sorry, is there another microphone? Yeah, uh, with, with the procurement of things, it's very, or, or whatever, we really need to differentiate between new initiatives and things that modify existing. With new ones, we should be going for much, much more towards using open standards and open, open protocols. With, with the existing ones, we can uh, accept whatever's there as long as it's documented and we can do things with it. Because in the short term, we want to be able to do stuff. Yeah. Uh, in the long term, we really want it to be as open as possible in terms of standards. So and I'm, two levels. I'm just going to add to that as well, because I've actually seen a project where open standards were promised, and then when it was implemented, it wasn't open standards at all. So just make sure that you do functional testing. <laughs> Um, so, actually making sure that uh, it's very annoying. Next. Hi, uh, Julian Carver from New Zealand. One of the things we're focusing on is the three pillars of open government you talked about here, um, seeing those as really interrelated. So, on, on your point um, about open APIs, any, it, one of the biggest benefits, um, and uh, one that was very much um, foreseen in the open data policy in New Zealand was uh, other agencies accessing each other's data. Yeah. So if you make data open to the public, it makes you manage that data, curate that data better, and it makes it easier for other agencies to access it. That's really the same thing, or very similar to the service transformation that you get by citizen-centric services, by putting the citizen in the front. By putting citizen in the front, you ha you're hiding the machinery of government and you're having to re-architect the way those government services work. So having, making sure, or getting to a metric, a, you know, what does success look like, of having every single system that is customer-facing in government being built using services-oriented architecture with APIs. Mm. So you're not just delivering a user interface, you're delivering a set of APIs. It's through those APIs that data can flow. It's through those APIs that somebody who um, doesn't like the fact that the interface is only works in IE6 can build another interface. And it's through those APIs that government can start orchestrating service transformation. So as you know, as a metric, as a thing to measure success and to achieve success, simply making sure that every single system mm. has APIs. So that's what Tim O'Reilly kind of meant, I think, when he talked about government as a platform. Yeah. That government should focus less about making fancy shiny user interfaces and more about making a platform, and having it, others do that. And it's a good metric though, because we can measure it. Wait, 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 wait for the microphone, and I can talk while the microphone goes to you. Ha! Huh. No, 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 take the microphone to them while I'm talking. <laughs> I'm a master of efficiency. Um, the, um, we can measure that. We can say, okay, you've got 20 customer facing systems, so what percentage of them are offered as an API? So it's actually something you can measure and start to actually so hold the account. So the way to do that Ooh. is make websites less sexy and APIs more sexy so that the minister can stand up at a, at a press conference and say, I am now announcing blah, and, and have a big red button? actually, you know, show up in the press. Sorry? So and, yeah, yeah, but uh, something to ask, I just missed the last word. Have it show up in press. Yeah, yeah. Because the launch of websites is now 
part of the platform, like ministers' platforms. Yeah. Certainly in my space. Um, the service, the service, not the user interface. Well, but this, this is the problem, though, that, and I mean, departments are related to portfolios, and everything's divided by a portfolio, and of course, ministers are going to be only interested in promoting their successes. This, this gets me to my personal goal um, in going into the public service, which is to actually have the public service have its own voice and be engaged directly with the um, public. Um, because it... <laughs> crazy! Um, no, but it makes sense, because the public service is the most motivated system that we actually have in society to actually serve the public good. Um, and, um, and if you actually do it publicly and transparently, then transparency is the public service's best defence um, and best offence in a way to getting best um, evidence-based policy. Because if we engage directly with people in how we develop policy, you know, and then it goes to um, you know, whoever needs to make the final decision, if they decide to not go with the, what has been the um, evidence-based policy you know, designed way, uh, that's been peer reviewed and that's been looked at by a whole bunch of people, then you know, that, that's, their, that's their choice, but they need to explain it to their constituency. There you go. Uh, next. Um, I think we need to also keep privacy, privacy as a high of priority. Yep, yep. Because all this in linking will kind of erode a lot of that if we're not careful. Well, it's funny. I think that that's a huge statement to say that all this linking will erode it just naturally. Cool. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it is a high priority. And I get really amused when, well, not amused, I mean, when people say, well, government shouldn't share data because that's an um, issue with my privacy. Well, if you had a system that said, okay, um, and this is, this is the goal for Australia Gov EU at some point, to actually be able to say, well, here are all the, all the bits of information we have on you. Are you happy to share this, this, or this? You know, and you, you share which data you're, you're giving permission to share. Um, then, you know, most people, just a matter of convenience, will do it. But, I mean, government, you know, it sort of, it does have your data, and it does have um, a lot of safety checks in place to actually try to protect it. But, I mean, so Facebook has all your data <laughs> as well. You know, all these, you know, everyone has all your data, and at least government, you can hold them to account on it, which is kind of nice. Um, okay, hi. Uh, hi. I just wanted to say, I think this, all of this stuff about open standards and APIs is great, but... I, I feel like it might be a better idea just to concentrate on getting the data out there, um, regardless of those things. I mean, once it's out there, then the community, community can get engaged, people can start yeah, you know, yeah. getting active on this, and they can create their own standards, whatever seems suitable. Um, yeah, and I think that's yeah. really the big challenge, is getting stuff visible. Mm. And let's not get too distracted by all the details. Basically. No, no, I agree. You need to have a strategic push, but at the same time, and that's why I said what I said before. If a department puts stuff out now and just gets it up, inevitably they get slapped around and then they withdraw, right? Because it's not in my standard. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but there is a lot of drive, and I think a lot more is going to happen this year. And it's, um, the, but yeah, but being one of the users of the data who is saying thank you for putting this out, thank you for using it, and creating those examples of how to use it, I think helps create the, you know the, the rationale for getting it out. But yeah, who's it? Um, I think the flip side to privacy, and privacy is absolutely a, a huge thing, but it's also a misnomer. So people will talk about, oh, we need to be careful about privacy when we're talking about releasing data with absolutely no privacy consi uh, considerations, whatever. So I think it'd be really good to get a statement, a general principle that completely unprivate data should always be available. Um, I'm talking things like the Open Government um, Australia, public toilet locations, or... Um, we actually have that statement now, though. You do? Uh, yeah. No, we actually, we, there is actually a policy now. Um, that, that there's policies are basically... At, at which government level? I apologise if I'm... Federal. Not no, that's okay. But, and this is the funny thing. There's a lot of stuff in policy. hasn't been translated through the action nearly enough. Mm -hmm. has been translated through a fair bit, but it's on its way. And, but there are... There's, there's policies that says that um, data should be publicly available. There's policy that says um, all uh, data should be Creative Commons by default. Mm -hmm. um, there's policy that says um, that all departments should be engaging publicly on consultations. There's... The, a lot of, actually, I've got a blog post about that. The, the, the policy stuff's all in place. Now we just need to actually make it happen, so to speak. Yeah, of course. Yeah. How do we do that? Okay, so clearly I'm a public servant and mm. at a state level, and I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. How do, and I 
for example, have had no luck in my group trying to get things like health promotion materials, Creative Commons. So we're holding copyright on stuff that says, hey, kids don't smoke, because it would be horrible to have those things, you know, be printed off by other people. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Non-derivative, we've got, you know, we. How do we get this yep. stuff pushed through? So um, one thing that's come, I'll just say one thing and then I'm going to pass on to someone else um, on this question. Oh, I'll, I'll put it up here too. The OAIC, which is the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, um, uh, and it's the Federal Information Commissioner, has actually, um, is putting out a paper um, soon on open data, which will probably be the best actual culmination of all of this content um, and a, a state of the union, so to speak, of what's happening in Australia that, that's coming out. And it's coming out quite soon. So. Um, ask them for it, and they're very, very, very good. It, this is all up on the wiki, so people can use it. We've got comments, some more comments down here, sorry. Um, but I think that in terms of our measurable and defining success, so if we start actually coming up with some baselines of how much data is out there, because, you know, there is actually a bunch of data that's publicly, publicly available now. Um, and um, so, you know, actually measuring where we're at so that we can see that we're actually making progress is probably a good idea. Um, get baseline. Who's next? Um, yeah, the uh, comment about uh, going right back to the start we were talking about, uh, the comment was made about the tax thing online. Yep. And I think when we talk about open standards and open systems and stuff, it's really important that, in a way, the government gets educated about what that really means. Um, there's a very well-known SatNav um, vendor who says, oh yes, you can update our map data via Firefox. But it requires a plugin which only runs on one particular operating system. Yeah. And because the plugin APIs of the browsers allow this to happen, it's very easy for them to fall into that trap. And yeah. we've got to be very careful that if they decide to go down the route of, of apps or whatever within the browser, that we don't actually defeat the whole mm. push by not making them aware that relying on it, like writing your plugin for a particular target platform mm. gets you out of this, you know, because I think, um, and I've seen this in a number of other um, interactions with government regarding small businesses and stuff too, that um, they require binary plugins in um, proprietary PDF readers, for example, to access their stuff. You buy anything from Standards Australia and you've got to read it on one particular platform because they don't supply the plugin on anything else. Yeah, and yeah. so even though you've got this whole idea of open and there's, there's a very different, there's many different views of what open means and for many people you say, oh, we need open access to the tax returns and they say, oh, okay, that's great as long as we verify it on Firefox, it's great. Yeah. But if that requires platform support, yep. which is not Linux, yeah, 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 then yeah. we're still locked out and we haven't gained anything. Completely agree. All right, I've got. I've just added that in. That's cool. Um, and I think education is a good idea. And by the way, the industry doesn't help itself with this as well. When you think about it, I mean, cloud first. Seriously. Anyway. Um, so this is as much a, a question as a comment. But when uh, the very, any level of government really goes out to develop a new system, um, presumably there's a mix of, of in-house and third-party development. Where third-party development is involved, is there anything to ensure that the government retains the rights to that software um, rather than paying third parties to this is actually increase their own IP? Um, and where we are, where the government is retaining ownership, is there ever the question asked of why this government-owned uh, IP mm. isn't made open as an open source? Um, yeah, yeah. It's actually. Own? This is actually a really interesting question because one of the things that came up, um, uh, we're actually getting someone from, so I, just to be clear, I work for this agency um, and um, oh, where am I, what, am I, what on earth am I looking for? Open source software, yes. They actually introduced um, new requirement, procurement requirements around, um, around ownership of IP and, um, and one of the things that, was, that, that came up with was the idea that rather than all I, IP created um, in a government contract being crown copyright and thus you know having to go through a whole bunch of other stuff that it actually stayed with the developer uh, with the government I think having uh, I need to, I need to get the details I'm a bit too tired but um, but with the idea that then they could open source it easily uh, having said that there's a lot of projects and I think we're going to hear a bit about are we hearing about GovForge today 
Yeah, we're going to hear about some projects today about doing code sharing across government um, in a lot better way uh, because there are a lot of departments that have put a lot of money in. They own the intellectual property. They want to share it, certainly across government and even publicly, um, under you know open licenses so that it can get reused because this concept that um, publicly funded stuff should be publicly available. I mean, you only need to look at the research sector to see how much we're failing at this as well. Um, but again, because the motivations are not aligned. If your motivation is a paper, then the research data and the systems that you've developed to use that data to come up with the outcomes from which you've derived your paper, they're not the important bit. Your paper's the important bit, so so much of that stuff just gets tossed. Uh, so trying to come up with systems that actually as part of your funding for government software development or research means that you actually have to make that stuff publicly available is good. It ends up being grenade stuff because it gets thrown over and they don't manage it anymore, but at least it's out there for other people to use. So there's one down here that um, if we can get the microphone down here. Uh, I'm, I'm, oh, it's still... Hi, Pia. How are you? I can't um, see who's I'm talking. I'm Elliot Bledsoe. You I, need to wave. I can't see who's talking. There we go. Hey. Hey. Um, I'm Elliot Bledsoe. I work at the Australia Council for the Arts. Uh, and before that, I did eight years at Creative Commons Australia. Um, I guess the one thing I want to sort of say is having come into a government agency that uh, its information management isn't a particularly high priority for what it does, or at least it doesn't see it as being a high priority. I think one of the biggest barriers to actually uh, implementing anything to do with OpenGov is that a number of the agencies don't have it as a particularly high priority and there's nobody kind of encouraging them to do it. Uh, before I got to the Australia Council, there was absolutely no knowledge of the idea of open government at all mm. in that agency. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, having somebody who spent eight years at Creative Commons was a very useful way of getting up to speed for them, but not every agency is going to have that opportunity. So I'd be really interested in some sort of a strategy, and I don't know exactly what that is, but to actually, I don't know, not a geek in residence, but maybe like an open yeah. access in residence into departments that don't have that knowledge or skill internally, um, whether that's pulling people out of the sector and putting them on, you know, secondment, within government agencies or people from government agencies that are doing it well into agencies that aren't. But certainly my experience has been that there are a number of government agencies, including the Australia Council, that don't know anything about it and don't really care. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, Dan, oh, we might just grab, he's been waving madly. Sorry, no. <laughs> your arm's, yeah, your arm's getting sore. It's getting you know, bigger on one side. Uh, g'day, my name's Hanari. Um, so I come from the community side, so I wanted to shift the discussion a little bit, because we've just talked about uh, what government can do, and mm. kind of, it feels a bit top-down to me, but that's just me probably being annoying. Um, and uh, uh, small plug, you know, come to the participatory democracy um, panel later today, because yes. this is what I wanted to go to um, the actual topic, which is defining success. Yes. So, for participatory democracy, which is a really important um, part of open government, I think, um, for that to, to define success around that, I'd define that as being a flourishing ecosystem of the community um, building their own platforms and so a community of civic hackers. Um, so I think that that would be a good definition of success that we should put down. How do we measure lots it? and lots of um, different people doing different things with uh, government data or you know making government easier to access for everyday citizens. How do we measure it? Um, by the amount of projects that are active, cool. um, number of groups that are getting together, yep. that kind of a thing. Thank you. Because this is the thing, if we can come up with a bunch of baselines and then actually draw a line in the sand and say, cool, here's where, even if we only measure it once a year, then at least we can see if we're going up or down. It's probably not a bad idea. I'd like to measure it more than once a year, but you know. <laughs> what was the next one? Oh, hello. Hi. Online referendums. Sorry? So, online referendum. Online referendum. Have you ever seen the um, the rise and fall of Michael Rimmer? <laughs> have you? No, I haven't. Can I, I'm going to play something for you very quick. I promise it's quick. <laughs> I, I swear to you. Huh? Do I have what? I don't. Oh, that's a good point. Of Michael Rimmer. No, but you, the, the visual will make it. Oh, what's going on? No. Um, was it Michael Rimmer? Was it him? No, was it Rumor? Yes, it is. Politics as usual. Come on, give me something easy. Along with the TV. One with the what? No. This one you reckon? No, hold on. Everything you're both now, right? Um, 
No, I'm actually, I'll act it out for you. So, I mean, the, it was actually really funny. So, you've got to watch this movie, right? Because the rise and rise of Michael Romero, yeah. Um, what he did was he came into, um, he, he um, uh, a politician in the UK, and he basically, his entire election platform to become uh, Prime Minister, and uh, to be, well, for his party and Prime Minister, was to basically say, we're going to do nothing. We're just going to do what you tell us to do. We're going to put all decisions in your hands. It's going to be a completely, you know, citizen democracy. You can do everything. And everyone's like, yeah, we totally know more than the politicians. So, you know, at first it was just like a couple of pieces of paper. This is before the internet, of course. But a couple of pieces of paper, and then a few more. And then you ended up with lounge rooms full of paper that they're signing and sending back in. They're like, oh, I don't care about the sewage system in Cook. You know, they're just, you know, and... and, and liquid democracy. <laughs> liquid democracy. Well, yes, yes, and that's... Yeah, I was totally, that's exactly where I went to. Um, I, I think that there is a, I, I th okay, now let's just, let's not do too much of this conversation because we're supposed to stop in two minutes, but the, the um, I think 100% citizen democracy, I think you do need people who know how the system works as well. You need like a somewhere not, in between. I'm not um, suggesting for a minute that it's 100% vote goes to, goes to the public, but there should be that voice available. You know, here's the for, here's the against, Right now. Do you know how many referendums have actually succeeded in Australia, like ever? Sorry? That's only because of how they choose to it's, it's not only because of that, it's also because it's it's a very yes or no, yes, you're right. And the way that the language is put in usually makes it work one way or the other. Sorry, repeat it for everyone else. Um, it, it, that's partly because we say that a referendum is passed by 50% of the, the voters and 50% of the states. but. Yeah we could, via a referendum on those rules, um, we could change that so it was some other criteria that was considered a pass mark for, for a thing to get up. I think we'd have to look at the constitution. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, and, and certainly th there is the paradox that you'd first have to get up a referendum mm. under those rules to change those yeah. rules, but it's and, not yeah. impossible. No, I mean, we, we, we could just get rid of the states as well, but you know, that's yes, also going to yes. take... <laughs> and and just, I just want to make really clear though, it's not because I think the states do a bad job, I think the states are actually really, really important, but three layers of government make it very tricky. Um, I think, yeah, but anyway. But I think more direct democracy is good, but for me, I think also direct democracy shouldn't just be yes, no decisions. It really should be, the, that's why the policy development, if you actually develop the policy openly and transparently, then it is people actually shaping exactly how it's going to look, not just being yes or no, we do or don't like that idea. Like it's, it, the it, devil's always in the detail, and if we can get people directly involved in the detail, then we can actually get a more democratic outcome, I think. Where's our microphone? Oh, yes. hello. Um, one thing I'd really like to see is changing the incentive structures for essentially the middle management. Right now, the incentive is to not cooperate. Ah. Um, the incentive is if you put anything out there, it's a risk to your career, so don't do it. Um, we don't have any... Uh, it'd be nice to have this website say, this group put out uh, this service to the public, this many people use it, um, it costs this much, and here's the cost breakdown. Mm. Suddenly there's an actual ah. incentive for people to start building services um, rather than... It, they don't see it as a risk. Yeah. Well, and here's an interesting fact for you, after doing a little bit of analysis of um, the, the, the public service demographics, did you know that 50% of the, the senior executive service of federal government are retiring in the next five years? What's the idea? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to comment, there's some actually very, very clever SES, but at the same time, there is a generational change that's happening right now, which is quite fascinating, and it goes to, to this point. Um, I'm just going to add the point there about direct democracy as well. Uh, direct democracy, which goes to Hanari's point anyway, um, more of it. Are there, where's the microphone? Hi, P. It's Flanders, back up here. Yeah. How are you? Um, so I'm going to play the Machiavellian and, and kind of look at what the, the UK has done with the Open Data Institute. And their metric right now is actually number of businesses that can actually be built off of this stuff and actually how much you can increase the, the gross national product. So as a success metric, um, I, I, and I always sit on this cusp because, yeah, we want to measure the bottom-up community and say all these goodwilled people are out there building these things, but I don't see enough talent in the space and a, a large enough community that's actually doing this, and that's because the incentive needs to be, well, we're going to make some money by actually putting this stuff together. So there's my two bits. So what are you suggesting? <laughs> 
that would the, be a moment. The simple measurement is year on year how many businesses are actually taking the open data ah. and actually creating businesses out of it and actually turning over profit. Yeah, cool. And this is the funny thing. This, this goes to the heart of too many people are like, oh, we can't possibly put the data out openly. Let's make it non-commercial. And it's like, that did not work in the open source space. Why are we trying to, why are we repeating all the same lessons with open data that we've already done with open source? Um, but anyway, uh, data. OK. Next. Uh, just from experience, I've found trying to promote open source yes. um, in government in various places, it's, there's a very um, conservative and defensive culture. And that um, I found it difficult to present cases where you can point to, say, the federal government, where there's a department that, say, replaced all their software with open source, and you can go, right, look at that, look, it's a successful model, there it's working. I know that it works from my own point of view, because I've just, through time, I've ended up switching over all of my equipment to using open source software. And, um, yeah, I was just wondering. Um, if the um, if like for example uh, a gimo might um, pilot say rolling out open source software in government to provide a model for other departments. So uh, it's funny because um, a gimo actually did that ten years ago. <laughs> It's actually very interesting. There was a whole pilot of a whole um, web platform that then went on to become very successful and then get closed source, which was interesting. Um, but um, in answer to the question, uh, so first of all, there was the requirements put in place uh, two years ago that said that every government tender, every government tender, the tender response has to answer how they've um, acknowledged open source. Right now, of course, government procurement people, you know, often sort of forget that. Now, um, the person who's coming to speak to you today from Ajimo, um, not me, because you know I'm technically you know, with a different hat on at the moment, who's going to be on our um, open data panel, uh, actually, uh, is also the person responsible for, primarily responsible for the open source policy, and is also responsible for IPv6. Actually, he's a, he's a pretty cool dude, um, and he watches all the tenders as they're going up on Oztender, and if they haven't got that procurement requirement, he calls them up. And he actually <laughs> enforces that particular thing. So it's actually been really interesting. And he, he's got some statistics around, um, although we're still actually working through them at the moment to try to analyze them properly. But um, we're, we're in the process at the moment of trying to do some analysis around, well, ha has that actually changed the outcome? Has that, you know, that uh, procurement shift actually changed the outcome? And we don't know yet, um, because um, the, the, the reporting of open source in an organization, if there's anything that we've learned, and I was actually involved in the first whole of government um, open source census a few years back and um, if there's anything we've learned is that the people down the stack are like yeah totally the people up the stack no we wouldn't do that it's too risky um, and so there's a real disconnect about what people know you can never um, replace I well the, the concept of replacing all your software with open source is very tricky and probably impossible um, because there's always going to be some hardware that has proprietary stuff there's always going to be some software that has proprietary requirements there's always going to be some random geospatial tool that you've been using for 20 years that you can't shift off you know there's so so again what's the measurement we want to take so is the measurement where are we and are we going up or down or is there you know is there a particular goal because we're never going to get a hundred percent if that makes sense I think anyway maybe I'm just a pessimist yeah um, looking across what we've written there and sort of the focus and some of the questions. One of the key success that we never talk about is trust. Do people trust the government? Hmm. Part of it is do we, we, we really need to separate government as in politics, which goes back to referendums and that yes. kind of thing, from public service. We need to be the public service, not the ministerial service. Mm. The risks associated with the middle management we talk about come because they are graded according to the minister's office, mm. not because they're delivering a good service. Once we get that trust, once we can change, and, and this isn't even legislation based, this is, this is almost sort of business as usual operating procedures for the public service. Once we sit there and say, right, these are services that we have to deliver day in, day out, regardless of who's in power, and therefore let's share and, and all have the same standards and all have the same code mm. for that service. Mm -hmm. And then the ministers can have their whims, they can have their, mm. their initiatives and that type of thing. Um, once we get that separation of church and state, effectively, <laughs> um, then we're going to see a lot more changes. Our right. success is measured by the trust. People suddenly have faith in using public services online or mm. offline or whatever. Um, and it's getting right back to those basic things. It's not about technology. It's not about uh, you know, 
transparency or openness, it's the fact that we have a culture that needs to be changed before we can go any further. That culture, um, that culture is because of the Constitution, at least at the Federal. The, the public services role is def very clearly defined in the Constitution. It took me a long time to understand that. Ministers don't serve their constituents or their portfolios these days. They don't vote based on what the people in their local area want. Well, the party system, there's a. I, I don't think that's a fair, fair yeah. Well, yeah, we're going to have to. All right, let's. Um, I want to want to close this because I want to get into the service delivery panel. So, if we can have the last two comments, but just very quick, and then we'll we'll jump into the thing. Thank you. So my um, suggestion for something that looks like success relates to trust, but it's a slightly different angle, which is about um, accountable data, about actually having some sort of provenance about how government agencies have captured, managed and maintained and used data. Um, it's metadata, I guess. Um, and, and that can engender some sense of trust in people knowing you know, the, the provenance of the data yeah. that they're using. Um, and, and that's not done particularly well. I mean, it's record keeping stuff, which is my area, um, but it's not paper files. It's actually sort of audit trail uh, mm. for data and data collections. I'm just going to add, uh, sorry, James Purser, I was up until, re well, up until last year working for the Local Government Shires Association of New South Wales. So my hat in this is at a local government level, whereas most people here, I wouldn't probably be far wrong by saying you're mostly state or federal. How many people federal? How many people state? State and the ACT is kind of the same as local. Yeah. Um, like See, the ACT government's like a really big council. Yeah. I, I work for the AC, I like actually work for the AC government. I actually really like like it, but it is a bit that's of not, a That's not actually a bad thing. Having yeah. it like a really big council is not a bad thing. Mm. But councils are probably the most service centric in terms of all the layers of government. Yeah. So they have specific requirements when it comes to this sort of open data, which state or federal don't yeah. necessarily face. Yeah, right. So I think when we're talking about you know, measures of success, we need to include how local is taking it up and how, how? local local government is taking up the ideas of open data and open government. They face the same sort of problems in terms of cultural problems. There are people in senior management who, you know, what the internet, what even is it? Mm. Um, you know, they get iPads, but they do email. Yeah. And that sort of thing. Cool. I think, I think that's great. I think we've got a, a few things there. I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to condense these notes and, um, and try and come up with a bit of a reporting template that we might be able to start to enforce or some, some, in some way. But right now...